Good afternoon, Hadassah friends and guests. I was asked to speak here today as a child of Holocaust survivors. I can't speak on behalf of a whole generation. Our parents all had suffering and heartache in common. Otherwise, they came from different countries, different socioeconomic backgrounds, education, and occupations. But this is my story. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a little girl who often slept with covers over her head to drown out the sounds of her parents' nightmares, sometimes crying, sometimes screams. We arrived in Newark, New Jersey in May 1947 on the SS Marine Marlin, a former troop ship. I was one year old at the time of our voyage having been born in a refuge camp in Germany, where my parents met and married after the war. My mom had kept a journal of her travails during the years of war, recounting her escapes from the Nazis, harrowing tales truly worthy of a film script. But upon passing the Statue of Liberty, she threw her journal overboard filled with a confidence she could now share with the world all she had endured. But my mom and other survivors came to a country anxious to put the war years behind them and enter a period of growth and new changes. For the most part, at that time, American Jews didn't want to hear depressing stories of suffering and atrocities. The Greenhorns brought with them their old-fashioned customs, clothes, recipes, and a language, Yiddish. A distant relative sponsored our new life. At that time, it was about $1,000 per refugee for visas, transportation, etc., to settle us in the United States. Housing was in short supply following the war, and large under-the-table fees were required to obtain an apartment. By this time, we were a family of 11, the largest family of survivors to enter the United States. Imagine paying $11,000 in 1947 to settle a family you didn't even know. That $11,000, adjusted for inflation, would have a value of $129,000 today. Imagine making that kind of financial sacrifice. We lived in a two-bedroom apartment with one bathroom. My two grandfathers, my grandmothers didn't survive. Three single aunts, one single uncle, my parents, and me. What luxury. I can't even begin to describe the happiness, the love and joy filled within those walls. And I was the center of it all, the hope of the American dream. Everyone left for work during the day while my mom stayed home to take care of me, prepare the meals, and housekeeping for the rest of the family. In the evenings, my mom, my family would take care of me while my mom went to night school to learn English and a little American history. But beneath all the happiness, I always sensed a level of anxiety lurking around us. When their friends came to visit, I often overheard tales of horrors. I was just a toddler. I don't think they realized how much I understood and how this affected me, nor did they try to shelter me from these realities. In fact, my mom often recalled how she hid among the weeds of a riverbank. The Nazis were searching for her as she was trembling to the sounds of their boots and a machete whipping through the weeds. This became a continuing nightmare for me for many years, but I was the one hiding there, trembling in my bed. By the time I was six, my aunts, uncle, and even one of my grandfathers started marrying and moved to Vineland, New Jersey, and we followed. Each of them married a survivor, and the family became its own nucleus social center. My sister and cousins started to arrive, and there were many celebratory occasions. Keep in mind, 
For the most part, the survivors were teenagers when the Nazis came to power and were now in their 20s. They had no formal education or training in any type of occupation. Vineland, New Jersey is a rural community located halfway between Atlantic City and Philadelphia. HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, helped finance our new beginnings. They extended grants to help the survivors purchase chicken farms. You may recall the Pittsburgh synagogue shooter blamed Hayas for the ills of immigrants upon our society. Vineland became a chicken farming community filled with refugees. They came from different backgrounds across Eastern Europe and their diverse customs became even more pronounced. German Jews and Polish Jews wouldn't even daven in the same shuls. As a kid, I didn't understand any of this. Hitler certainly didn't care. When they were rounded up into ghettos, cattle cars, and concentration camps, they were all struggling for that same breath of life. But as part of the second generation, we became one pack of friends, friendships I still cherish today. Most of our parents still spoke Yiddish in the house, broken English flavored with accents in public. We were starting to become Americanized. We told our parents we wanted to celebrate Thanksgiving Day. No, Mom. It's not a Goyish holiday. It's an American holiday. We introduced our parents to peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on white bread and other such American delicacies. Our giant brisket sandwiches on thick, crusty, dark bread were just too embarrassing to take in school. In fact, I would sometimes trade these sandwiches to purchase chili con carne from our school cafeteria. Just delectable and totally trafe. Sometimes, when I went over to some of my friends, I would start to smell the scent of bacon and other unfamiliar foods. But in my house, we remained strictly kosher and Shoma Shabbos for many more years. After several years of life on the farm, the business of chicken farming became financially disappointing for our parents. The whole community was struggling to stay afloat, become, becoming unable to compete with large Midwest operations. But as kids, now teenagers ourselves, we put our parents' pressures aside and enjoyed a wonderful youth. Parties, sleepovers, we enjoyed all aspects of American teenage life. We didn't even notice what we lacked in material wealth because we were all so similar. No one really had anything, but we were all happy. Sleepover camp? Never heard of it. Our summers were spent at a river. Our parents dropped us off each day with our large black inner tubes. There was a shack with pinball machine and jukebox where we filled hours of summer fun. When our parents could get away from the farm, they would join their friends there for games of cards and picnicking and more stories of their war years. There were American Jewish kids in the community, but they were too different from us and we rarely intermingled. Their parents were the professionals or merchants in town. We lived on the other side of the tracks, but that was fine with us. In an effort to make a better living, farmers started leaving their farms for better futures in Philadelphia, Atlantic City, and New York. Some became quite successful in their new endeavors. But my world came to a crashing halt when my father passed away of a massive heart attack. My mother was only 34 years old, left with the burden of raising me and my younger sister, as well as running the farm. I remember one incident we had with a migrant worker that we employed. He came to the house and said, Mrs. Ressler, I have some terrible news. My mother asked, what? What happened? The dog kicked the bucket. Kick the bucket, my mother replied. So pick it up. 
For that, you came to the house to tell me? Just a little anecdote about the idiom of a foreign language. Five years later, my mom remarried. My stepfather survived the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto, five concentration camps, sexual experiments by Dr. Mengele, and the death march from Auschwitz. He was in many ways a broken man with a history he could never really conquer, but he fought that battle with courage and dignity until the end. At that point, we moved from Vineland to North Jersey. It was the early 60s and I was 17 years old, and I think it was the first time I started socializing with American kids. It was then I realized I could really be like everyone else, at least on the outside. I think deep within ourselves, we are a generation that tried so hard to honor our parents and not burden them with our own problems. We tried hard to make them proud and bring them nachos. We are definitely defined by our parents' history, even though we did not live through the past. I always seem to have so many conflicting emotions towards my parents. Some part of me always felt responsible for their happiness. Another part of me felt inadequate. Would I have had the courage to fight the evils they overcame? At times, there were feelings of guilt for living the stress-free life they provided. I also felt rebellious. I wanted to shed the aura of sadness in the house. It was always someone's yurt side. Reflecting on my life, my whole generation, as well as that of our parents, I think the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation made the biggest impact on the life of the survivors. They were suddenly honored for being survivors rather than refugees or immigrants. They were proud to tell their histories and the world was finally ready to listen. Today, most of the survivors have passed on and we bear the responsibility to protect their history in a world where so much has changed. I personally feel a strong obligation to make sure their past is never forgotten, and I hope you can try as well. Anti-Semitism is, is once again rampant across the United States and the world, and we are challenged by deniers and pervasive feelings of hate in our society. Recently, a principal in a Palm Beach County school was removed from his position. He wasn't sure the Holocaust actually happened. Just imagine. I wish he could have seen my stepfather's Auschwitz tattoo. In fact, when my son was about four, he said, Papa, why did you write on yourself? My stepfather, wanting to shield him from the truth, told him he couldn't remember his telephone number. But a couple of years later, he came home from Hebrew school and said, Pop up, you lied to me. I know what the Nazis did to you. So where do we go from here? Our children and grandchildren are 100% American. They've started intermarrying. They're assimilating. They feel just as comfortable with their non-Jewish friends as with their Jewish friends. They experience personal, and professional successes and failures in the same way that everyone else does. They're comfortable having a Christmas tree in their homes. Oh, Mom, it's just a symbol. We can celebrate both holidays. Oh, really? Your grandparents or great-grandparents would be turning over in their graves. But we say nothing. Somehow, we lost that right. It is undoubtedly true, as President Obama said about his own family's assimilation, that only in America is this story even possible. But with assimilation come the challenges of preserving what is special and unique, particularly against the backdrop of the suffering and sacrifices of my parents' generation. My children and grandchildren represent the third and fourth generations of Holocaust survivors. They, like others of their generations, will need to make their own choices about the role that Jewish traditions and values will play in their lives. My niece, on my deceased husband's side,
grew up with only the most casual connection to Judaism. She told me at her daughter's bat mitzvah that inspired by her memory of my parents, she is becoming more active in her synagogue and planning a trip to Israel. I know that not every member of the next generation will make that same choice. I do hope, however, that the story and lessons of my parents' generation will be told and retold from generation to generation. It is incumbent on us and those who follow to ensure that their suffering and sacrifices will not have been in vain. I would like to close with a quote by Elie Wiesel. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Just let that sink in. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Thank you. Any questions or comments?